to District 216. Santa Barbara's private, members-only, exclusive social club. Enjoy our four pillars of content. Thank you for being here. Come on uh, from inside. If anyone's in there, come on out. We'd love to have you all here. Um, thank you very much for helping form this community uh, within our unique Santa Barbara community. We're sort of a subset here. Um, we're going to be co-creating something really special today. Before we get started, one more time, give it up for Ben Catch. Uh, he's... Uh, he's an incredible Santa Barbara-born musician, but we're lucky to have him home for the summer. He's at Berklee School of Music, so he's back from Boston, and um, I've creatively collaborated with his father for like two decades, so I'm very grateful to have him here. Like when I met him, he was in diapers and pacifier, and now he's playing music at our events. This is awesome. Um, so we are officially launching uh, something today called District 216. There's a 216 on the wall there. Maybe that has something to do with how the name came to be. I don't know. Uh, but Dis District 216 is a uh, private membership-driven social club, both physically in spaces like Lodo Studios, where you all are today, and also virtually to a global audience. Um, so you, some of you may have been to some of my past music events, cannabis events, startup events, or networking events. And I thank everyone for, for your support over the years. Um, I produced my first music and uh, arts and education festival in 2007 to a sold-out Arlington theater crowd called Solutions for Dreamers Festival. It was a uh, benefit for local nonprofit Heal the Ocean. We had about 35 nonprofits represented there. So community building and unique event productions clearly in my DNA. Um, but District 216 produced events are, we're going to be calling them edutainment. They're always going to comprise both educational and entertainment components. And we're just here as a container for humanity's growth and healing, and we're excited to build our programming alongside the community. So I know a lot of you have folks that might uh, be great speakers or facilitators, et cetera. We're very open to having future events with, uh, with your network. Our District 216 events are gonna be based around four pillars of content, art, music, cannabis, and psychedelics, often blending these in stimulating ways. Emphasis on stimulating. Our first psychedel psychedelic event is today, so welcome. We're calling this uh, the Change Your Lens series in hopes that our content helps shift consciousness and the lens that we reflect upon our world. A um, couple bits of housekeeping before you leave today. We have a little 30-second survey. We'd love for you to fill it out so we can make these events the best we can. If you want to leave your email, you can, you don't have to, um, to learn about what our future memberships and future events look like. And also buy a raffle ticket. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for holding this District 216 vision with me. We look forward to sharing ideas and collaborating and building this community. All right, so let's get on to the main event. It's my proud moment to introduce uh, to introduce Dr. Uh, Ramey Drozd, who has an enlightening presentation about ketamine therapy in store for everybody here. I personally had the profound experience with, with Dr. Ramey three times, actually, um, and that's why I was inspired to, to um, bring him here and, and do this event. So I'm excited for him to articulate ketamine therapy for everybody. Um, Dr. Drozd is the founder of Santa Barbara Ketamine Therapy. He's a board-certified emergency a medicine physician with 15 years of experience and is a fellow, uh, wilderness, a fellow of wilderness medicine. Uh, he's used ketamine to treat patients in a variety of clinical settings since 2011, and he has an unblemished safety record. Uh, he's observed the benefits of psychedelics and their impact on improved well-being and consciousness and a dedi has dedicated himself to this emerging field since 2020. 
He's completed training at the Ketamine Therapy at the Psychedelic Coalition for Health and is currently studying at the California Institute of Integrated Studies. He will be training, uh, he's in the training program for MDMA therapy as well through MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, this summer. Um, so he'll be adding to his arsenal. In his continued research, he believes that ketamine treatments can provide the missing piece for many people uh, that are looking to feel well again. And outside of the office, uh, Dr. Ramey loves to kite surf in the waves, ride his bike through Santa Barbara Hills, and be with his family. So please give Dr. Ramey Drozd a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. While we make sure this is on, Jacob, thank you so much for letting us use this space. I think it was really important that we, you know, bring the community together and having a, um, sorry, having this free event. So you offering up this space is a big deal. So um, bring your hands together for Jacob. <laughs> Great. So. <coughs> And again, thanks everyone for showing up. It's Saturday, it is hot. We're all in the sun, but I think, uh, you know, it, I haven't seen anyone leave, so thank you for sticking around. Um, so I'm going to pull a little bit of a bait and switch on you guys. The lecture is Ketamine 101, but this lecture is actually about consciousness and awakening in the contents of Ketamine. So I want to start with a, taking a little bit of a glimpse into what mental health looks like today. And then we'll do the who's, what's, why's of how ketamine uh, applies to that. So current situation, what's the number one cause of disability in the United States? Anxiety. Anxiety, depression, yes. Depression. But we'll talk about it. That's kind of a, a, a um, there's a fine line between what depression is and what anxiety is. So I'll, I'll elaborate on it. So this is a slide looking at eight years of data, looking at 2009 to 2017, and uh, evaluating how much depression there is. It is a worsening problem. So uh, specifically in people younger than 25, it's, uh, it went from the eight to 10% um, range up to 12 to 13%. Uh, the, in the younger population, we're actually able to attribute this to social media and making f you know, inauthentic relationships, um, but it's regardless of why, it is getting worse. And I, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone, uh, the current situation is only getting worse with the pandemic. Fast forward to September uh, 2020, we're almost hitting 20%. Oh, and looking a little bit um, into more details of it, um, we looked at the UK, in pre-pandemic they said 10% was depression, and they, by mid-pandemic it was about 19%. The United States did a further study and looked at anxiety and depression. And they're saying that by December 2020, 45% of people meet criteria for actual major depressive disorder or general anxiety, which is huge. But I'm going to reflect this specifically on how the United States manages um, some of these situations. We're not the same as the rest of the world. Specifically here, I'm saying that one out of six Americans have a, a prescription for a psychiatric drug. And one out of five matriculating college students are on some kind of a medication. So we're kind of telling our, our citizens that we're going to use a pill to fix the problem. And it's very obvious when you look at how we manage pain. We're only 4.5, definitely less than 5% of the world's population, but we prescribe more than 80% of the opiates in the whole world. So, um, you know, speaking of changing our lenses, we need to change it inside. But what is it? Just another problem. We're going to start an opiate pandemic. We're going to we're going to neglect some of our people looking at healthcare. I mean, it's just another thing. Is this fine? It's a uh, I don't think it's fine, but we're, it seems like we're neglecting it a little bit. So how does, how does the healthcare system look at these diagnoses? We use a reductionistic model. 
A reductionistic model is something where you take, it's a principle where you analyze something that's very complex and you try to reduce it down to a simple uh, explanation. It works great if you're at the mechanic, if your brakes aren't working right, you can narrow it down to fluids or calipers. Um, even in the healthcare system, if, the, if you're having symptoms of high glucose, you can narrow that down to are you not resp responding to insulin or are you not making enough insulin? But when it comes to consciousness, this is, this is a whole new experience. Um, it's hard to reduce it down to a single thing. There's multiple models that we use in our healthcare system, but we narrow it down to chemical imbalance. We don't have enough dopamine, we don't have enough serotonin, but basically we're saying that you are the problem. The, your body isn't working and it needs to be fixed. And then we have a lot of drugs to treat people to try to get them better, but we're not, we're, so we're managing the symptoms, but we're not focusing on how we're gonna get someone to recover. We're just holding, you know, holding them over, getting them through another month or a year. Um, I'll take that one step further. Right now, if you were diagnosed with depression or you presented and said you had it, the first step would be to use psychotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, which works, which when done intentionally and well, could get you out of the situation but it often doesn't work as well. The next step would be a first generation antidepressant. The next step would be a second generation. And then they do accept the notion that acupuncture and exercise and yoga work. And the, so the medical model does um, have some degree of an open mind, but if this isn't working, there isn't a plan B. And it makes, it begs the question of, are we asking the right question? These people present with these symptoms, and we have a couple tools up our sleeve, but, and we try them, if they're not working, are we looking in the right place? Einstein says, if I had an hour to solve a problem that my life depended on, I would spend the first 55 minutes trying to determine um, the proper question to ask. So let's look at that for a moment. Patients that meet these criteria are coming in with these various symptoms. They're experiencing hopelessness, they're experiencing insomnia, they have low energy, they have self-deprecating thoughts, they're worried, they're irritable. I mean, sounds like they're depress depressed or anxious, but either way, they're, they, uh, it sounds like we have to treat that exact issue. But in my 15 years in the ER, I got a, a very unique opportunity to to experience humanity when, uh, when something has failed, meaning people could have an ch adverse childhood event, people could have um, grief that they're experiencing, people may ha have been abandoned um, and, and, and have a lot of hurt. So what do they do? They turn to ways of suppressing that feeling. They use alcohol, they um, get addicted to other chemicals, they, you know, they, they get into trouble and they start, um, they may get involved in, in crimes, they need more money, so things start going wrong. And then they present, and when they, if someone asks what's wrong, they, they present as, I'm hopeless. But maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe we should look at the causes of this. Maybe we should identify that they're, we're not, they're, they may seem like they're low energy and they can't concentrate because they can't go to sleep, they don't feel safe, they don't feel connected to the world. They have unresolved grief and trauma. They, they don't feel a safety within their own body. They don't feel like they belong to their community. They don't have a sense of wholeness. And I think that that is where we should focus our energy, not on how to make those symptoms go away, but how can we get people to get out of the experience that's causing the problem? And I think that is waking up. These people aren't awake. It's not that they're depressed. They just aren't in touch with their inner peace. And it seems like a lofty expectation to just create that. What if there was a way? So in comes ketamine. So, what's ketamine? So I think it's, everyone's got a, a little broadsided by this one because if you ask most people what ketamine is, it's a veterinary tranquilizer. Cat and horse is the favorite one I hear. It's addictive, it's a party drug. It's, it's not good, right? There's, you don't want ketamine in your life. But also, the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, the New York Times are all publishing that this is actually a new treatment and it actually works. The truth is, ketamine is all those things. 
but anything can be abused. I'll describe exactly what it is scientifically and we'll work our way through how it can help. So it's a dissociative anesthetic. So in, uh, in my work in the hospital, uh, there's lots of anesthetics I could use. Propofol, Versed. If someone's shoulder pops out and I need to get it back in, I need to give them an agent that will relax their muscles so that I can put their shoulder back in. And ketamine is one of those uh, options. Um, but it's, in some ways it's better than the other agents that I use because it's so safe. It has the safest profile. It won't de decrease your ability to breathe. It, it'll maintain your uh, pulse and heart rate in a really safe level. It was first this created uh, in 1962 at um, Parkey Labs and wasn't FDA approved until 1970. Uh, Parkey Labs is, a, is an interesting place actually. It's the first uh, like biochemical pharmacological research uh, headquarters in the United States. I think in the 1860s it was founded. Things like Dilantin, one of the first uh, anti-epileptics was discovered there. The Nobel Laureate, um, uh, the Nobel Laureate, uh, Jonas Salk discovered the vaccine for polio there. So it's been on the map for several reasons. So when it was FDA approved in 1970, it was deployed right away to the Vietnam War. People would use it as a buddy drug, uh, a buddy uh, helper, I think they called it. If someone were to be significantly injured, they would deploy it in an auto injector, kind of like an EpiPen, and you can inject it into your friend and help them self-extricate uh, from the scene, but, they would, um, but they, it would never compromise their blood pressure or heart rate, so it was a safe thing to use, completely out of the field. And um, it's considered the World Health Organization's top 50 most essential drugs. It's on every ambulance, it's in every hospital, it's um, worldwide, it's one probably the most popular anesthetic. Uh, in the world. So <clears throat> I'll keep the science to a brief, but, uh, a brief couple of slides, but how it works is on different receptors than the typical psychedelics. It doesn't work on tryptamine. Uh, it doesn't work. Um, well, it, it works completely differently. It binds something called an NMDA receptor. And by doing that, it reduces uh, the inhibition on these um, synapses and it deploys a lot of glutamate. That's all we need to know about that. On the molecular level, it's, it's very dose dependent. So in the hospital, I use five times higher doses to get someone to sleep. In this, at a psychedelic range, it's much, much lower. I'm using one quarter or one fifth of what I would typically use in the hospital. And that, and that has all the effects that we'll talk about. Also, it has a neuroplasticity effect. It actually um, helps dendrites remodel and it alters the way that your nerves work. Um, again, briefly, it's hard to see, but this is the this is the control. The drug of interest is ketamine, and then they looked at DMT and LSD. What you'll see is on the top line, the dendrite or the axon, the way that the nerve communicates, remains uh, remains the same. But with the psychedelics, they actually branch out. It's actually physiologically, the neurons branch out and attempt to talk to other parts of the brain. So there's, uh, it's like the fountain of youth. It's in inviting your brain to talk to other parts of your brain and create more uh, connection within yourself. But even this aside, I think that the consciousness um, uh, component of uh, ketamine is even more profound. It creates emotional arousal and profounding meaningfulness. And how it does that is it's hard to explain. It's, this medicine is so ineffable, it's hard to really describe how it feels until you've tried it. But I'll use two quick models to describe how it works. Basically, it blocks the default mode network. This is the part of your brain that communicates your executive function, like where you really think, with the part of your brainstem that, that is your subconscious. So it tries to turn off how, um, uh, how it, it allows you to stop overthinking something and be in your subconscious. And I'll explain this with the two models. One will be kind of evolutionarily, uh, evolutionary model, and the other one will be looking at uh, EKGs, really briefly, EEGs. So if you look at the brain, it developed um, continuously. So first we had like a hindbrain, and then we developed uh, the midbrain, and then the forebrain. It's not like one ended and the next started. They actually uh, added to the function of one another. So 400 million years ago, we had um, 
fish, reptiles, amphibians, these animals just had the hind brain. They were incredibly present. They just had reflexes. You, it just is the way you would see a reptile. It just does what it's trying to do and then responds to the environment and runs, runs off. Um, but it didn't have the ability to have any consciousness or, or processing. 200 million years ago, the mammalian and primate brain developed. This actually, we've seen, if we consider a herd of gazelles, a herd of animals, they co-regulate. They live in, they have uh, adaptive relationships, they have autonomy, but, they, um, but they're incredibly present. These animals, they, they seem to have their own um, ability to regulate but want to be in communities. And finally, the prefrontal cortex. This is very specific to Homo sapiens, and this has only been around for 150 million years, 150,000 years. So it's very recent. And he, Homo sapiens <clears throat> create their own problems. We have consciousness, but in consciousness, we're able to project the meaning of who and what we are, and we create narratives. So we're able to be in this mammalian body, and we're able to be present and be in a herd. But we could spend all of our time thinking about where we parked and whether our taxes were done right and whether or not we're, you know, we made another mistake and completely rob yourself of being present. The other model I'll describe, and this is describing the same thing, is the EEG. So if you put electrodes on your brain, you can actually measure the frequency across your brain. And there's five basic um, frequencies. Delta, down low, where you're sleeping. Theta, where you have dense imagery, you're dreaming. Um, and that's right here. Alpha and beta are both low levels of consciousness and then normal alertness. And then finally, gamma, where you have deep in concentration or really being having enlightenment. And I'll show you this for a hot second, but we're not going to talk much about it. Mammals and humans have been well studied, and we've looked at how ketamine affects them. I'm going to summarize it in this slide. When you give a psycholytic dose of ketamine, it turns off the alpha and beta. It go, the, the, the frequencies go down to an indetectable level. So the part of your brain that's thinking really turns off. Then theta, dense imagery, gets significantly mag magnified. It takes up 50% of the bandwidth. And every once in a while, you'll have a spike into gamma. So you're in a dreamlike state, and you're having bouts, little spikes of inspiration, of, of breakthroughs. Um, and you're conscious, you're awake, you remember it. You, you don't want to walk around, but you're, you're, uh, you'll respond to, to verbal stimuli and you'll be able to, to uh, interact with the surroundings. But what does this do? I mean, this is a beautiful opportunity. This medicine turns off your consciousness. So if you're experiencing regret, fear, uh, put FOMO in here, you're insecure, and a part, you wake up every day and you're experiencing, um, you feel like you're, you're suffering. What if we could turn that off? What if we give you an opportunity to stop thinking and experience your, your dense subconscious, to be within yourself just for a little while? You realize, you know, where you give your energy, where you concentrate, you give life to those things. So if you concentrate on that thing you messed up last year, every day, then you've messed up every day. What if for a moment you could turn that off and you could start healing? I say it's a round trip ticket into your subconscious. A lot of us have some kind of suspended trauma. You know, this, this forebrain of ours, our prefrontal cortex, allows us to you know, plan for Christmas and, and make beautiful um, engagements in the afternoon and think about our weekend while we're sitting here at this lecture. But it also allows you to hold traumas and suspend and re-traumatize yourself over and over if you, if you can't break that harmful narrative. So what ketamine does is shuts off that narrative. It, it allows you to self-realize. It gives you awareness and awakeness. So everyone has an inner peace. Everyone remembers when they've probably had, when everything was perfect. But there's something else going on right now. The people, when people show up to us, there's something that isn't working. How can they get reacquainted re with themselves? That, that the part of themselves that loved themselves, that had unconditional like, gratitude, that, that wanted to connect with everyone? <clears throat> if you could recreate that for 45 minutes, that might feel like four years, that when you come up, 
you can start re recreating your life. And, and it, I say it's deep awareness. And everything, the more I study this space, the more I, it resonates with uh, the Eastern philosophies. You know, if you touch any one thing with deep awareness, everything else falls in to place. You know, you might have the entire list of, of symptoms that are consistent with depression and anxiety. But once you re-engage with hope, once you lose your, that narrative that says that you're not worth it, then all the other things resolve as well. Things can just get better that way. So who's it for, right? I mean, this sounds like it should be for everyone. Currently, um, in the medical model, the people that are uh, eligible for it are treatment-resistant depression and major depressive disorder. But just as I mentioned before, it, I, I don't really resonate with that, that reductionistic model. To meet that criteria is a little difficult. It seems like anyone that was willing to wake up, anyone that has something that they want to rekindle and, and, and the way anyone that wants to enrich in their life could benefit from this. And uh, rather than list the, my criteria, I'm just going to go through three quick vignettes and just describe some people that I see that um, have benefited from this. Uh, I slightly modified it just for, uh, for um, privacy, but a um, 75 year old woman that'll come in and she says, I don't understand. I have everything I need. I, I um, have people that love me. I, have, I don't need money. I have, I'm comfortable. But ever since all this media, COVID and Ukraine and things have been happening, I've just been disconnected and I can't get back. She goes, I'm not depressed but I'm not happy. She says, I always thought depression would feel like dense sadness. I thought I'd be crying. But she says, I feel nothing. I just feel nothing every day. There's another case, 32 year old male that's had a breakup less than a year ago. And now he says, it occupies every morning and every night. He just runs around trying to distract himself. He goes, I'm not that depressed. But everywhere I look, I look at the mistake I made and I should be back in this relationship and I can't stop being myself about it. So I saw a doctor and he prescribed an SSRI and I don't want to start it. He goes, I'm young, healthy, I shouldn't be on these meds. He's looking to wake up. And last vignette, 55-year-old man says, I had a tough childhood. I, um, I've been in therapy since I'm 11. I was 11, and I can out-therapize the therapist. It's, I can anticipate exactly what they're gonna say. I don't know if I can benefit from therapy anymore. I've been on all the medicines. They helped, they helped for a little while, and they kind of stopped helping, or I didn't like the side effects. I'm, I'm, I'm over it. So he's, he's looking for a change. And I just briefly have been exploring this, and you know, is, is therapy accumulative? You know, sometimes we, we wonder, um, it feels like someone's trying to run a race, a, a 5K. You know, they feel like every therapy session is, 10, uh, is 100K. You have to do 50 sessions, and by the end, you cross the finish line and just get through it. Um, I feel like is, if you can have a single breakthrough that's powerful, and you see yourself again, then it's not about adding it up. You can get all the healing benefits in a single moment. And I, I made an analogy here, but I'll, I'll slide past it. So. I'll, um, I'm gonna just briefly say how these, all these three people did. The first person that didn't feel anything, uh, she, after her first treatment, she says, I'm, I'm back to painting. I've, I, I had a depth of, of understanding that none of these things matters. It doesn't affect me. There's no reason for me to be, um, to, um, uh, really live these experiences and she said that um, she couldn't understand how she possibly gave so much of her energy to these negative thoughts and, and just move forward and she goes I'm just doing well again this 32 year old male he uh, similarly um, he similarly just changed his frame of thinking and said I don't need to give this any more bandwidth. Within two sessions, he couldn't even remember why he was there. He were, by all means, he knew why he showed up, but he couldn't relate to the person that was having these self-deprecating thoughts and the FOMO and the regret completely dissolved. And the last person, 
I mean, this person's been in therapy for 40 years. Like, are we getting these kinds of results? This person's uh, a typical person that had pronounced but slow progress. He pulled back, he cut back on half of his medicines. He identified that he was, um, that, that he started doing therapy differently. He loved therapy, it's still working for him, but he started to show up differently. So the subtle changes he made in his life allowed the same things that he's already doing to have a bigger impact. So, so that's how, um, so that's the background. And um, the question is, how do people get started and get involved in this process? So if anybody wants to get um, into a psychedelic treatment, the, the first most important step is to figure out if you're a good fit. So wherever you end up exploring this um, space, they, everyone offers some kind of uh, connection, like a discovery phone call. So the way to connect with this is you, you reach out and you talk to the people involved in the process um, and, they, and they'll tell you um, if you're a candidate or not. After that, someone would just get uh, for, uh, totally evaluated. They look at the major and minor exclusion criteria and decide whether it's a good fit. And then it's all about intention setting and optimizing your body to go into the medicine. So setting an intention is, is saying what you want to get out of this. I say it's like writing an invitation. You decide who's going to attend this event. You decide where it's going to be held. And you can decide you know, what the theme of this event is. By having, knowing what that is and having those intentions, it really directs what it feels like when you have this profound experience. Psychedelics are non-specific amplifiers. So you could take something the size of a nickel and make it into a galaxy. So wh what you say and how you prepare yourself what you say to yourself will make all the difference. And, th and that's how um, psychedelic therapy becomes really profound. Um, we also endorse self-care and doing a lot of other preparatory steps. Whenever um, we connect with someone, it's all about making sure that we identify that every one of these people has an inner peace that they want to be connected to. So we know that we could reunite you there, but we have to kind of talk you through how you could possibly uh, access this place. And then, um, and then we find ways of giving it to those people the authority to get there. It's an active coping mechanism. It's not like getting a medicine like uh, an antibiotic and just taking it every day and then hoping that, that you're better in seven days. This is about showing up, doing the intentional steps, journaling, doing the writing, doing the, the breath work, however we de determine is the best um, process for you, and then, and then showing up um, for the medicine. Um, and intentions are hard, but the way we frame it out is it starts with an intention, it becomes a practice, it turns into a habit, before you know it's second nature, and by the end it's who you are. And if you could tell us what you'd like to get out of this therapy, and in a few weeks or months, it's who you are. I mean, it's an overwhelming success, and this is what sometimes happens. So we just discussed some of the preparatory steps, um, and then you um, get connected with a, a therapist. You do an intro session, you do a two-hour uh, treatment, um, and then you integrate. So after each treatment, you get a two-hour, or you get a one-hour um, uh, psychedelic, I'm sorry, <laughs> a therapist that integrates you. Uh, these therapists are all people that have to have, have sat with ketamine themselves and have to have the experience of what it's like to hold space in non-ordinary consciousness. And it's not the same um, psilocybin and ayahuasca and ketamine are all different. So everyone has to know what this space feels like in order to be able to engage in it. Um, on treatment day, we encourage you not to eat. You can't drive after, so you have to have someone that get, takes you home. You can still take your medicines. You're always encouraged to wean off them, but you can take them. Um, and then we invite you to journal and, and stay hydrated. On the day of your appointment, we revisit your intentions, we do breath work, uh, we do some psychological softening exercises, and then you go in. With my treatment, we use intramuscular ketamine. So ketamine uh, is, can be done, done orally, IV, or IM. Orally, you get about 10 to 15% of the agent gets into your bloodstream. So you have to do much higher doses. IV and intramuscular is about 98% bioavailable. So giving an injection is very rapid. You go into the space in about two, or th two to four minutes, and then you're there for about 40 minutes, and you come out almost as quickly as you go in. It's all about 
doing the inward journey. So you wear an eye mask to take away distractions. You wear headphones uh, with music that's curated by, by maps to kind of follow the arc of the journey. So it's, uh, it's rapid and stimulating in the beginning and then it kind of plateaus and then descends, it becomes more calm and relaxing. Um, and then around 45 minutes to 55 minutes, people come out and, and then it's, you know, we talk about where you've been and then we revisit the, the intentions and, and that's, that's where the magic happens, a golden hour. And then people go home. We encourage you to, you don't want to work the, that day, but we encourage people to find a physical and emotionally nourishing place. Um, and there's this beautiful window of neuroplasticity that happens for about three days. It allows you to, to have those dendrites that open up and that reconnect parts of your brain. It allows you to reconnect and re-evaluate things that you're doing on a regular basis in a slightly different way. And uh, s treatments can be up to twice a week, but usually they're once a week. And it allows you a lot of time to integrate and really make sense of what's going on. So um, in conclusion, you know, it's uh, actually I wanted to, to conclude by just saying one more thing about how I got into this space. Uh, so um, I've been an ER doctor, and then how I how I transitioned this space is my own work with psychedelics. I found that so many people weren't healing, and so many people were in healthcare but weren't getting healthy. And I realized that a very small population was actually going to expose themselves to psychedelics. You either related to the counterculture, which is a tiny population, or people that would do drugs. We're talking like 3% of the population. So I found this as an opportunity to, to hold space for people that don't identify with either of those categories and help them have some awakening and have, help them have healing in an intentional way. And in my own um, practice with the medicine, I realized that I wasn't authentically aligning with healthcare. Because so many people got their arm fixed and they got the laceration fixed we're still hurting, but went home and weren't healing. So I find this is the first step towards you know, creating a new career where I can start healing people. Right? Thank you. And before we do Q&A, I had uh, one of my clients that was uh, that's in the audience wants to come up and chat about uh, her experience with this. Hello. Hi, I'm Carrie Zup. I've been a patient of Ramey's since February of this year and have done four ketamine treatments uh, to date. I wanted to thank you all for coming here today and having an open mind to learn more about this powerful treatment that's often overlooked and not taken very seriously. For the next couple of minutes, I'll be walking you through my thoughts and feelings before, during, and after treatment. It is part of my integration being here today and sharing, since I hate public speaking, <laughs> but I also love to help others, so the latter wins and here I am. I have to say, as someone who runs on the critical, judgmental side of things and who definitely doesn't wear rose-colored glasses, even though I'm wearing them today, which is weird, um, I was very skeptical of this treatment. Um, and to give you context, I confront a lot of depressive periods in my life due to um, some very heavy past traumas. And they just seem to still live in my looping feature of my subconscious. I've tried so many modalities, different kinds of talk therapy, antidepressants, clean eating and living, exercise, and so on. And just when I thought I was out of the fog, I would just always come tumbling back down. So, when the opportunity presented itself to possibly try ketamine treatment as a way to combat my resistant depression, I scoffed at the idea. I mean, am I really at the point of taking a horse tranquilizer? <laughs> as much as I thought it was silly and it would never work, I was also curious. I'm a curious person by nature, having dabbled a lot in psychedelics for both fun and spirituality in my life. So I was open to having at least the experience. I had nothing to lose. I first had my medical intake with Ramey on Zoom, where he inquired about my lifestyle, any meds I was on, and an overall picture of my physical, mental, and emotional health. 
He also assigned me an integration therapist at that point that I would be following up with after my first session. <laughs> Fast forward to the night before my first session. I was so nervous. Um, as someone who is very familiar with psychedelics, I was very nervous about having a, quote, dissociative administered to me. As a natural control freak, I of course went down every Reddit and subreddit rabbit hole to read about what to expect and how it would feel during the experience. To my surprise, so many individuals couldn't express or describe what they felt during the treatment. That completely baffled me. How can you not describe what you have experienced? I just didn't get it and it made me even more nervous. I read endless articles about how many people it helped in so many ways, so I was just going in on a leap of faith and was just gonna trust the process. Again, the word dissociative just bugged me out. I did not wanna dissociate and leave my body and have any weird, freaky train spotting moment. I prepared for my first session the way Ramey outlined, refraining from alcohol and processed foods and all the things that would just get in the way of having a full experience. Within five minutes of meeting Ramey, I felt myself losing the worry and relaxing more. I found positive energy right away from him and he led me through some calm breath work and intention setting before I had my treatment. It was a very relaxed, open and honest dialogue and it put me at ease. The office space itself was very relaxing more of a spa-like vibe than a medical setting. I laid down on the couch when I was ready, put on my eye mask and earphones that he provides. He adjusted the level of volume and started the instrumental music playlist that was very soothing. I covered myself with a blanket and he injected the dosed out treatment into my upper arm. It didn't hurt at all. He taps you on the arm in five minutes to check in to see if you're feeling it and are okay. But I never felt that tap. I was gone. <laughs> and now I know what all those Reddit threads were talking about when they said that you can't describe the experience. <laughs> you can't, I couldn't. After about 45 minutes, I had no awareness of time. I came out of what I was in. I was just in awe of the experience. It was a surrendering to the flow of consciousness and I was held in loving care by the universal fabric. I floated within myself, getting to know and connect with every part. It was absolutely beautiful, and I felt so much love towards myself. I felt very calm and at ease. For the next 20 minutes, I talked with Ramey about how I felt in the moment and what kind of feelings and thoughts came up throughout the treatment. I had my friend come pick me up from treatment as directed because I still felt a little fuzzy dizzy after treatment. Little did I know what would unravel for me in the next 24 hours. Everyone's experience is different, but for me, the shift was very fast and very obvious. I felt my lens to the world's change. All the things that used to bother me and add to my negative mood didn't anymore. I felt that the intention that I set before my treatment come alive before my eyes. I couldn't believe it. It's not that I became this positive person. I just began to look at things subjectively and not be affected to the magnitude that I was before. I felt lighter, I felt more joy, and I felt motivation to actually embrace life. The next day, I followed up with my integration therapist and discussed everything that was shifting and coming up for me. We, dis we discussed ways of how to acknowledge and incorporate these positive shifts in my life. Being someone who really doesn't enjoy writing and journaling, <laughs> I was ecstatic to be able to integrate these insights and new thoughts into practices that resonate more with my being, which is creative expression, like art and movement. For the first time in my life, I felt confident and hopeful that this could be, have lasting impact. I could actually live an enjoyable life and not carry the weight around anymore. I just completed my fourth treatment this past Wednesday and still hold the same awe of what comes to surface and manifests from treatment. Each treatment experience has felt completely different to me and all serve as key catalysts to the shifts happening. I feel that ketamine unlocked a door that has been padlocked for years and not accessible by any other means. All it did was unlock the door and hold my hand as I walked through. It gave me the courage and self-love to do the real work, the integration into everyday life. I'm really excited for this new wave of healing to come to surface. 
Ketamine does not treat the symptoms like so many antidepressants do, but rather goes right to your subconscious core and allows you to rewrite, reroute your mind to stop the looping. These new neural pathways bring subjectivity into your life and let you let go of what no longer serves you. I finally understand the meaning of dissociative, that word I was so scared of at the beginning. To me, it means you're able to dissociate from attaching yourself to the old programming, old programming and narrative. You get to say goodbye to the old story that isn't your story anymore without a positive or a negative feeling. It just is, and it's no longer, and it's okay. It won't bring you pain anymore, and it won't show up in your life in another storyline with another person. You're awake now and aware now and have the ability to put it to bed. I get to enjoy life and its challenges from a new manageable angle. I'm no longer feeling engulfed by the problems themselves. It's pretty damn liberating and empowering and you feel it in your body, mind, and spirit. I'm forever grateful. And uh, thanks for attending my TED talk, <laughs> sounded like. Um, and I'm also open for Q&A with Ramey now or if you have something private that you wanna discuss, I'm happy to meet afterwards too. Thank you so much. Uh, is ketamine approved by the FDA? Yes, since 1970. Okay, so it's a pharmaceutical medication, or is it a plant medicine, or how is it synthesized? Totally synthesized. Um, okay, it is no not one. natural. Okay. And it's, yeah, it's been FDA approved, I mean, 50 years and as an anesthetic. So it was, it was a, the, they found that it was um, psychedelic, you know, I would say it was an accident that they found that it was, that it was psychedelic when they were checking different doses. And the psychedelic uh, component of it hasn't really been aggressively used in the first 30 years and then so the past you, 15, 20 years. plans a, a pro-legalization or pro-decriminalization or do you want people to have access to plant medicines and ketamine and things like that or are you more for a controlled setting? Uh, yeah, great question. I'm, I don't think ketamine should be you know, highly accessible, but I'm definitely pro-legalization of plant medicine. The psych well, it's, it's, there ha there's more, there's more side effects. There's more, they can have more harm. There's no question that there's, um, that uh, psilocybin and other plant medicines are a bit safer. I'm not against any, I don't have a stance of being against any of these things, but I think a psychedelic experience is helpful. Yeah, that's, the milligrams is, I won't get into that, just so specific, and I don't think it'll, it'll illuminate much for the crowd, but the, the experience you have using intramuscular or IV or controlled ketamine it is nothing like the experience people have when they use it recreationally. And I can say this because I've treated people that report something of this, the, the report that they've done ketamine over a hundred times a decade ago when they were partying in New York or other parts of the world. And when they come out of this, they say it is not the same. And the, the, um, the programs I'm, I was with in LA and the people that I'm with in San Francisco have been in this space for 20 years. And they don't see that people are transitioning in any way. I'm in MAPS. I will, be, I will be trained to give MDMA, and I'll be offering it here as soon as it's legal. And, I will, and I'm with USANA, so I'll also be able to give psilocybin. I'm, I enter the space through plant medicine, through psilocybin. Um, the only reason I'm using ketamine is, well, there's two reasons. One, it's profoundly psychedelic and is very good at what it does. And it's the only legal opportunity for people to do this in a safe way. Hi, thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, my question's around integration. So mm -hmm. you had mentioned in your, in your story that the guests that you'd pro who you brought with you and who you've been working with. Um, so you take one, one dose, one session, and then you do a second, a third, and a fourth. What's happening between session one and session two? So my, my question really is, like, what's the integration process like? And are you regressing between session one and session two? And I guess like, the even bigger question is, is, how do you avoid this becoming more of a crutch? You know, versus like you do the four sessions and now you're kind of through that intention that you came that you came for in the first place. Thanks. Hello. Okay. Um, sure. Different things come up at different times. Um, a lot of internal family service kind of models and 
uh, reaching that. There's just kind of some prompts that are giving to me and some writing and some um, movements. So when those feelings come up, to be moving through them and to un be understanding them and letting them go. Um, it's been different. It's not that I necessarily put it to bed um, from session one to session two, but each session is just completely different and we're addressing just different angles. So by my fourth session now, it's kind of, it's giving me a bigger uh, mindset picture to be able to handle this without the usual, usual reactions and my usual go-tos. Yep. And I'll say one thing to that. It's, the, the goal is to help you wake up. The, the people that experience bliss, it's, it's more clairvoyance, it's clarity. They're not feeling like they're being supported for the treatment and then it just fades away. The goal is to reorient how you approach life. And if you just start doing things differently, that's, a, that's sustainable. How many treatments do they need? Um, we, I'd suggest three, uh, to, but six to eight is the medical model. So I endorse everyone to get involved in at least three system, three treatments, because if they're if they open everything up right away, then you won't really complete it if you don't go that long. And if you're um, advancing slower, then it, it might take you two or three treatments before you notice a significant difference. Yeah, um, yeah, there are major uh, occlusion criteria. Um, people with like a bipolar disorder one that are have active mania, people that don't have the insight and judgment to do the proper integration and, uh, and may not be able to um, manage uh, symptoms uh, are excluded. Anyone that's in any kind of mania, I think this can promote it, I would, I would exclude. Um, but uh, schizophrenia is, is Schizophrenia is uh, a minor exclusion criteria because it depends on how, where they are when they show up. So in general, I take it very seriously. And if they did want to enter the treatment, I would start slowly. I would endorse them to go uh, you know, sub-psychedelic for one or two treatments and see how they respond before we go to higher doses. No, you know, it works okay with borderline personality. It, it, sometimes... Um, I'm in, when I do the intake, I'm in no hurry to get people into the medicine. If, if it seems as though they need to do a lot of prep, I will connect them with my therapist and they'll do weeks or months of prep before they're ready. And it's not until that therapist and the patient identify that they're ready to move forward that they enter the medicine. Question back here, Remy. Yes. Thanks. Uh, my question was, are you treating people outside of those two diagnoses that you said it's currently prescribed for? Like, are you... Are you working with people outside of those? Yes. Okay, so you're open except for the contraindicated things, is that? Absolutely, because it's, there's, you know, the second, the 32-year-old that was, that barely met any criteria, it did astounding. His quality of life got so much better. He's the worried well, but he's doing better than he's ever done before. I think that it'd be a failed, um, the system, I'm not going to continue failing people if, if they have to fit in that box. So, um, so I do. Yeah. Uh, yes. The people that you, um, the people that you talked about, it sounded like they had come into their into kind of situational depression, or they had been whole and then became not whole. Is it also effective for people who've never known what it was like to be whole? Well, I think that the third vignette of the 55-year-old gentleman that suggests that he was in, in uh, therapy his entire life, he really couldn't suggest that he's ever had, ever felt normal. Um, I think people that would describe that would progress slower. But yes, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of benefit and a lot of people can learn about themselves when they turn off the parts of their mind that, that are causing them to feel that way, even if it doesn't seem like it's deliberate or if it happened to them in any way. Yes. Hi, I had a couple of questions. Sure. <clears throat> so I'm a psychologist and I was thinking about, you know, how some of the clients I have are stuck. And, and I was just curious if there is a profile, I understand you know, what you're talking about in terms of increasing consciousness in general, but are there specific kinds of diagnoses that you would recommend considering for this kind of treatment? So, because in the media right now, they're talking a lot about the research they've done at John Hopkins, New York State University, with psilocybin, where they were working with people that were cancer patients, 
extremely depressed and extremely anxious, who had a very favorable outcome. And I was just curious, do you have sets of diagnoses where you'd say, yes, this is generally very beneficial? I think treatment-resistant depression and anxiety is the mainstay. Treatment-resistant anything. You've tr you are intending to, you are attempting to get better. You feel unwell. You've tried something. It didn't work. You're willing to try something else. That that is in a, in a you know that's an umbrella that can capture most of my clients that succeed. Okay, and then all of a sudden the ex governor of Texas is touting psilocybin and he's wanting to see Texas lead the way because <clears throat> he came across someone. I was surprised to hear Rick Perry talking like this, but I was surprised that he had come across a, a vet yeah. and his vet friends as it turns out in talking to Rick Perry about it, would go to Mexico and they would get psilocybin treatment and this was really having an impact on their trauma, which was interesting for me when you were talking about the neural reset. Um, and I was just curious, so would you extend that to trauma, people that are stuck in traumatic states? Absolutely. I mean, okay. it's, it's an MDMA. The, we use the protocols for MDMA that MAPS uses. Um, and I'm not sure if you know about that agent. And the protocols we use are basically identical. Psilocybin, MDMA, DMT, and ketamine are the same, are doing the same thing. They're trying to open up your heart. They're trying to reacquaint you with the part of your life and the part of your body and the part of your consciousness that wants to show up on this world. I'm an advocate of all those agents. I'm, um, and to answer the, what the gentleman was asking me earlier, I want them all to be available, and they will be soon. This is, this is the first way of doing it, and, it the, and it's available now. And four years from now, when I have half of these or all those medicines available to me and I have a consciousness practice in town, we're going to be able to really figure out which one of these is right for your exact purpose. We might find, you know, one beautiful thing about uh, ketamine is it doesn't have any um, uh, contraindications against almost any medicine you're on. If you showed up and you were on Prozac and you wanted to do psilocybin with, therapy with me, you'd have to wash that out for eight weeks. I'd say, no problem. See you in July. And in July, you could start treatment. But I, you could start ketamine treatment. I wouldn't recommend it this week because I want you to do a week of preparation, proper set mindset. But I'd put you on the calendar right away. And you could do ketamine for a week or two while you're weaning your, your, um, your treatments. And then you could transition into whatever feels right. If you find that you have trauma, MDMA might be the right first step. And then if you want to really open your heart, you want to experience unity with, with plants and life and transcendence of time and space, we'll put you in psilocybin. Got All it. of these things are extensions of the same process. And I'm, uh, I approve, of, and I want to use all of them. And last question. Yeah. <laughs> um, with psilocybin, what they're talking about is they're going to insist that there be a therapist in the room and also somebody else who I guess is medically qualified yeah. as far as future treatment, which to me, I don't like. And I was just curious, when you were presenting yours, it sounded like you were the main guide. Is that right? With her? Yes. The The... The model that they started with, and I worked with the guys at Hopkins when we we're doing this, had to have a male and a female and the provider. It was a huge resource expense. I mean, if you really build hourly, this to be enrolled in a, in a, in a six-week trial will cost you $12,000. I mean, literally, we did the math. So there, the first step, just like the steps towards making marijuana legal, they found they wanted to use it for a glaucoma and this other indication. They jumped through all the hoops, and as soon as they got it through, it became recreational. With this, they, they're using PTSD and trauma and end of life as the indication. They're, they're, they're making it very clean, very safe, making sure there's no one hits any snags. And once they reclassify it, like right now, these, you know, psilocybin is schedule one, right there with cocaine and heroin. Um, once they reclassify to schedule three or four, then, the, then they can start using it for everything. And the goal, and the, the, the media makes it look like it's only for one thing, but when we're, I'm in the, the process and I'm in the trainings, it's very obvious. The goal is for this to be ubiquitous. Yes. Hi, Ramey. Thank you so much for this uh, incredible presentation and sharing with us and for doing this kind of work in the world. 
I'm wondering if there is an inventory of links and or literature that you would recommend for the counter to counter culture kind of audience who may be sensitive or averse to anything associated with the sort of hippie culture. I'm wondering if there's, other than maps, is references for um, studies and research on ketamine, if there's documentaries, if there's um, books or articles that really um, bridge the gap to the world that's sort of uh, averse. Yeah, um, you know, my the first thing I read was Ketamine Papers by Phil Wolfson. That was my, that was what opened my eyes. When I read that book, I realized that this is not the agent I had given a thousand times in the hospital. This really has a lot more to it. And to be honest, I have a lot of journal articles that I've read, but I, I couldn't right now direct you towards a place that would, that would meet that description. I'd be happy to email you personally and, and share some of those things with you. But there, um, psychedelic support, I know, is a really great place where a lot of therapists can go and, and, and offer integration for people. And they also have a lot of resources. So if the short answer is, I think psychedelic support is where I would direct someone right off the cuff. But, um, but I would be able to share um, things with you specifically. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, can this be used for chronic pain? Um, the way it's used for chronic pain is not the way I use it. They would start an IV with you and they'd put you into the sleep state. So that EEG that I showed you, they'd put you in delta. You'd be unconscious for four to eight hours. And that makes those neurons kind of grow and change the way that they process the pain. And you will and you will have to do that for four to six days in a row. And so you spend a week in the hospital, you get infusions, and some people with chronic pain syndromes say they have relief of pain for months after that. But it's completely different than the way I do it. And it's not a psychedelic, it's a medical procedure. Hi, thank you again for this talk, this is great. Um, I have two questions that I'll stack together and you can pick how to answer it. Um, I have a friend who as a child uh, suffered from scarlet fever really bad, was hospitalized and given high doses of ketamine. She, later in life, is very clairvoyant. She gets all sorts of messages and I always kind of wondered, was it because of all that ketamine she got as a child? And she doesn't think so. She trust it's just her natural connection to spirit and I you know bless that I think that's probably the truth and ketamine maybe maybe helped maybe it didn't but the second question is that I have a family member who has multiple sclerosis and she has the lesions on her brain and her backstory is highly traumatized from being in a hospital where she was naked and exposed as a toddler and Henceforth, this childhood trauma carried with her her whole life, and I believe that trauma manifests in our body and then creates the illnesses. So I, I look to ketamine as a possible solution for her to help heal that, but I wonder if in your studies and research, have you ever heard of this connection between this universal bridge to consciousness, like my psychic friend, and is there a way to undo the physical traumas, the physical manifestations of our illness once you're doing the ketamine therapies? Do you see resolution in that way? So the first question, the answer is, I don't know. It sounds, uh, you know, it sounds like it could be, but I bet, it, I bet she's that way. I don't know. The second question, psychedelic psychotherapy with whatever modality you have access to is an amazing way of treating trauma. I think it's one of the best ways of treating trauma. And that can be with, if you have connection to a really good ay ayahuasca gr group with real intentional integration, if you have access to underground psilocybin, if you can get it in, become a volunteer in a MAPS trial in the Bay Area or in LA, or you do ketamine. To all those things will offer you the opportunity of getting out of that, to get out of that trauma state, to, to fully let go. And ketamine being dissociative is really effective at helping you let go. But what MDMA does is create that blissful state or that unity of, of to all living things that psilocybin creates can all heal you. And in different ways, we could get you to the same place. So I would endorse that for her. Yes? Dementia? I'm sorry? Does this help with dementia? You know, I thought it would. You know, these dendritic arms that extend? And I've... 
and I looked for the Parkinson and, and the Alzheimer's dementia data, and the, and the, very little has been done on it, but the amount that has has not shown uh, results. And to be honest, just from my experience, I feel like it's almost like the work has to be done early. Like it, it's hard for it to take some of this in dementia and create more connections and reverse the dementia. But I feel like if you had done it earlier, it's like mental rehabilitation. Like you, if you keep allowing those things to happen at younger age, I think it may have a, a benefit down the line. But unfortunately, I, I really wish that that data that might be collected in the future, but there's nothing that shows that dementia or Parkinson's can be improved. Well, neuroplasticity. Sure, the question was, is neuroplasticity permanent? Um, it seems that on the molecular level it is, but the consciousness changes it, um, will be transient if you don't integrate them. So, um, so it's hard to, to take those things apart. And so if I said that if we did a, a treatment, a three treatments, and then you didn't integrate at all, you didn't have a therapist, you just did an infusion at one of the infusion places, and you should have had the pharmacological molecular benefits of the neuroplasticity, why aren't you better a year later? I'd say maybe that, that uh, either hasn't been studied well enough or hasn't really shown that it's beneficial enough. It might be, have to be more prolonged, and that's not a realistic treatment plan. Is the development of neuro neuro pathways a result of the psychedelic experience or is there somehow a chemical process that take could take place with smaller doses like with microdosing you know i i'm involved so i'll answer that slightly differently than you asked i'm involved in a ketamine microdosing pilot and i've enrolled maybe 85 people and the people that started microdosing without having done a high dose before have never had a psychedelic experience have a mild to moderate benefit. The people that will have a psychedelic experience first, once or twice typically, two treatments first, and then start microdosing, do much better. Mm -hmm. The reason is once they open that experience, once they have a big dose and they, they start their neural connections, they're able to, in the, in the space we call a drop-in, they're able to go back into that space. They can use holotrophic breathing, they can sit on the beach and close their eyes, or they can microdose and get back into that connectivity. They can be reacquainted and be aware of who they are again after having touched that void. But it's hard to get, without getting there, I'm not sure you can stay there. So that kind of answers the question, I think, about the microdosing part. And I don't know the answer whether the consciousness connects it or the chemical pharmacological, um, uh, I guess, effect connect the neurons. That's, that's not defined. I would have to speculate, and it would just be my theory. Is there any connection with long-term deep meditation? Uh, I don't know. In general, is it, uh, are people more likely to have good experiences if they've had past experience of meditation or does it enhance their experience of meditation or? yeah it's it's there there's definitely um it's, it's definitely obvious that people that are either psychonauts and have done psychedelics before or are yogis meditators people have, that are in touch with themselves uh end up having much more profound and deeper experiences and are able to integrate better so um i, th I think that was your question you, yes. so meditation would help you uh benefit and it'll help you optimize your treatment. Yes. Hello. Yes, uh, I just wanted to comment that I had worked with uh, kids with autism and autism and um, developmentally disabled kids out at, at the old uh, place in by UCSB that was there. And I found it interesting that um, THC and smoking pot sometimes would help some of those kids not have seizures and to avoid that whole thing of the seizures, which is really hard on them for developmentally disabled people. And that it's just kind of a parallel. Like if, if marijuana helps for no seizures, perhaps your treatments would help uh, those you know, more severely developmentally disabled uh, people improve. And, and like you said, some, is it applicable like that or not? It's hard to say. I have to look at that case very closely. So each, each case gets a very high touch evaluation. And some people start with oral trochees and we, and we see how they do, especially in younger populations. And we can always get to higher doses. The lower doses are called psycholytics. So if someone really responds well to a lower psycholytic dose, 
then we can explore going higher. Um, so the, if, if the patient's motivated, their support systems are motivated, they have a, a, a medical person that's involved, then that's the case that we would definitely explore. But it's, but, but people have to really have to want to show up for this. And so if, if someone's um, motivated, uh, there's, there's probably an indication for it in some degree. Gotcha, thanks. I, I think it would. Something tells me it probably would. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Ramey. Thank you, Carrie. Of course. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>